Those of you that were here last week will know that we've just started a, a new series for our sermons called Family Matters, which Luke introduced last week. Uh, and today we're going to think about our love for each other in God's family. I'm so delighted that we're having this series. It's good at any time of year, but particularly at the beginning of a new year, to think again about what it means to be God's church, to be called to be people together, walking this journey alongside each other, serving one another, and what that means for our witness to the world around us. This is so important. And so today we're going to read from John's Gospel and chapter 13, if you want to turn to it or flick on your various gadgets. Um, John's Gospel, chapter 13. And let me just say, I'd encourage you to read the whole of this chapter later on. We're going to get into the incredible narrative, the story that these verses I'm about to read to you are held within. And I pray that God will speak to us through these verses, but they are held within a far bigger story of God. So at the very least, read chapter 13 later on. We've not got time for that today, and so I'm just going to start at verse 31. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Let's pray. Thank you for your word, our Heavenly Father. Jesus, thank you for your life lived before us, one of example, one of what it means to demonstrate what your kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, looks like on earth. And thank you for these words left to us today. Lord, spoken to a small group 2,000 years ago, but just as relevant for each one of us here and now. So I pray, Spirit, speak to us. Lord, challenge us where we need to be challenged. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. But Lord, make us more like you. Amen. I want you to picture the scene. I want you to put yourself in this story. Imagine this. You'd walked with Jesus for three years. He called you from the lives that you knew before. Some had given up everything to follow Jesus. And at this junction, you'd seen Jesus perform mighty miracles. You'd seen lives literally transformed before your very eyes. This had been your experience for three years. It hadn't all been easy. In fact, a lot of it had been incredibly difficult and challenging. But it was slowly dawning that this person, this rabbi, this teacher who you had been following might just actually be the Messiah, the one who'd been promised, the saviour of the world. And then Jesus draws you together for a meal. It's coming up to Passover in the Jewish tradition, one of the high points of the annual calendar. So significant. And Jesus draws you together and takes you to a room to eat together. But before you eat, this mighty rabbi, this one who you suspect might just be the saviour of the world, does something outrageous. He, he takes off his kind of outer robe, wraps it around himself, grabs some water, 
And despite the fact that you've walked in sandals for miles, your feet are not smelling fresh. They're not looking pretty. This great Messiah grabs a bowl of water and kneels before you and washes your feet. What? I mean, the actual foot washing thing is not unusual. Some servant, probably the kind of one that drew the short straw in the house, would have done that anyway. But, like, no rabbi does that. No master, no teacher does that. The most important person in the house is the one that is served, not the one who serves, right? How demeaning, how humble this person is. What a sacrifice they've made. How servant-hearted they are to wash my stinking feet before the meal. And then, if that wasn't shocking enough, outrageous doesn't even begin to describe what happened next. One of you will betray me, says Jesus to us gathered in that room that night, his disciples. What? It can't be. Surely not, Lord. It's not, it's not me. Pretty much everyone bar one in that room is shocked to the core. Surprised beyond belief. A couple of the disciples try and kind of discreetly, difficult, because it's a smallish table and there's only 12 of us sat around it, discreetly try and find out from Jesus which one, which one of us is it that, that's going to betray you? And then Jesus, with this highly dramatic act, says, I'm going to dip some bread in the bowl in the middle of the table. Normal way to eat in that society, to share bread and to dip it in common bowls. The person who I give that bread to, that's the one who will betray me. Who's it going to be? Can you feel the emotion rising in you as you're watching this scene? Can, can you sense something within yourself, that nervous sense of anticipation of what is about to happen? And he gives the bread to Judas. Judas... He was the one that kept the money. It's not like we had a lot of money. You know, the disciples probably didn't have very much. But he was the one who was trusted with it. He'd, he was one that had seen the miracles. He'd seen lives transformed by Jesus. Surely it can't be, it can't be him that's going to... But Jesus knew. He already knew that he had been betrayed and that it would be Judas who would be the betrayer. Judas gets up from the table and walks out. Now this had been a dramatic meal already. Do you agree? Are you awake? That's great. Hopefully you're still at the table, sat there, looking at Jesus, having had your feet washed, having seen this go on. But then it gets even more shocking. Because then, after all of this, Jesus then says, guys, I'm leaving now. I'm leaving you. He's not just nipping out for a breath of fresh air. He's talking about actually leaving, returning to his Father in heaven. Jesus knows what is coming next, that he will give his life, that he will die, that he will eventually be raised to life and return to his father but at this particular junction his disciples know none of that all they hear is i'm leaving the person who called us from our lives the person who called us from our families the person who we've given up everything for is leaving i mean some of our expectations haven't been met yet to be honest lord uh, we've still got some quite high hopes that haven't yet been realised, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, we're not quite sure the job's done, to be honest, in our eyes yet. What do you mean you're leaving? What are we supposed to do? What on earth are we supposed to do? A new commandment I give you. 
love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Right, now as you sit here today, there's great power in those words, but put yourself back in that room with those disciples. It's very nice, Lord. Good. How's that going to change the world? Is my question. I mean, we've basically been relying on you all of this time. Apparently you're leaving. And the big news is you want us to love one another. Brilliant. How on earth is that supposed to change the world? How on earth is that the most important thing to tell us at this most significant junction in our lives, in our walk with you? Well, those 11 disciples and others who joined them spent the rest of their lives trying to figure out what that meant. Frankly, with varying degrees of success. But the truth is that the evidence would suggest that 2,000 years later, that profound new command is just as important for you and I as it was for them. Can we say, Hope Baptist Church, that as disciples called to follow Jesus, we've nailed this one down proper now? Surely we can move on. Because we love one another in this family as Jesus has loved us. For that matter, given that by our love for each other, we'll people know that we are Jesus' followers, that we're Jesus' disciples. What do the people in the communities around us see us like? If there is a bit of a brutal bell ringing of reality here, it's to help us to understand that with God's help, we can move forwards. My guess is that most people that look at us from the outside in will see good things that we do, but potentially a broad sweep of the church, which most people in our society on a good day would do, um, that actually they don't see love as the defining feature of the Christian church. I don't know whether you would agree or disagree with that. Maybe, if not more worrying, you'll find and you will know, and maybe today you are one, of those who is part of the Christian church, who, in looking at the Christian church, would not say that loving one another is our defining feature. Because you've known hurt. You have known brokenness. You have known pain cut to the core of who you are by those who you thought were your brothers and sisters called into that same church that you are called to be a part of. So much infighting, so much bickering. Certainly, our attitudes, our actions, and our words do not always demonstrate anything close to anything could be called love, let alone the love that Jesus has for us. Now, maybe we're just taking this a little bit harsh because possibly Jesus' command to love one another was supposed to be aspirational, right? Possibly it's not actually supposed to be really a reflection of our day-to-day lives together. I mean, we are human after all, aren't we? So so Jesus clearly is asking for something unrealistic. Is that all right? Uh, It's it's not. it's, It's purely an aspiration or... Or or maybe when Jesus said love one another, he kind of meant it in that kind of distant theoretical sense. You know, like I'm kind of fond of my second cousins twice removed because, well, they are kind of part of my family after all, aren't they? That kind of love, right? Or, or, Or possibly the words that you've read in English 
in your Bibles this morning have been far too radically translated from the original Greek that the New Testament was written in. Possibly they don't mean love for one another in that deep sense. There's surely different ways of interpreting this, right? Well, except that I can't think of another single example in Scripture where Jesus said something that he didn't actually mean what he said. And he actually did say that. You don't have to believe me, but it translates pretty directly from Greek. You can't get around this thing. Look, there are scriptures that are open to all kinds of different interpretations. There are all kinds of things that we might fall out over where there isn't clear teaching from Jesus himself that we can go and find. But this is not one of those sisters and brothers. This is as clear as day. What we have here is a stop the press, hold everything, wake up and pay attention, spoken in the most significant of moments to disciples of Jesus. Someone, please write this down and take notice of it for the future. New commandment, people listen up, says Jesus, love one another. Do we hear? Do we hear the words of Jesus? Here's what he doesn't say. Chaps, if you wouldn't mind, try and put up with each other. If it wouldn't inconvenience you too much, could you at least put some effort into showing that you might like each other a bit, particularly when you've got visitors in? What he doesn't say is, guys, make sure you always agree with each other on everything. Let me stop for a second on that one, because this is a biggie, not just for us in the church today, it's been a biggie for the Christian church since it very began. Jesus does not expect us to agree with each other. That's not a command you'll find anywhere in Scripture. Look, if you want to go to a church, worse still, if you need to be part of a church where everyone else agrees with you on atonement theory or the new earth, old earth debate or women in ministry or human sexuality or or pacifism or your eschatological perspective of the end times or the nation state of Israel or the Calvinism versus Arminian debate or the style of worship that you're comfortable with or what you think about veganism or or, or whether or not you've chosen to drink alcohol or, or whatever your mask wearing etiquette is. Look, if you need to go to a church where everyone agrees with you on everything, you will go to a church of one I can't go to church with my own family, with my own wife. If that's the definition of what Jesus wants his church to be like, it's not going to happen. And God knows that. What he calls us to is something, strangely enough, far more profound. Dare I say, life-changing, dare I say, community changing. Dare I say, in the generation that we find ourselves in, the greatest Christian witness that we can have in the world today. Because you know that in the last few years, in our nation, if not across this planet, and you can blame whatever you like, you can blame Facebook, you can blame politicians, you can blame whoever you like, but we live in a world where opinions have polarised us. Have we not? Some of us lost friends over the Brexit thing. Some of us aren't speaking to family because they feel differently about us to certain things, whether they're to do with things within the life of the church or whether they're things that are in broader society. We live in this time where we're utterly polarised because we cannot give away to anyone anything because they feel differently about a certain something to us. That's not to say that we're not allowed to have strong opinions. Don't hear me wrong. I believe we are. It's a good thing. 
What I'm saying is the greatest witness to the world is if the Christian church can learn to love each other and live together despite the fact that we've all got strong and different opinions. Do you know why? Because they, no one else can do that apparently. That's, we're not seeing an awful lot of that in the world around us at the moment, if any at all. And so the kingdom of heaven doesn't look like a group of people that all think the same about everything. What it looks like is a group of people that love each other despite the fact that they feel differently about different things. If that had changed the world, would it not? Do you think people would look at the Christian church and want to be a part of it if they saw that exhibited? Are we doing it? Are we doing it? But how? But how is the big question. But how are we supposed to do that? Nice one, Jesus. Great command. How are we supposed to do that? Jesus says, well, a new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. How has Jesus loved us? Well, look, there's whole loads of verses that I could chuck at you through the whole New Testament that talk about God's great love for us, that laying down his life, Jesus demonstrates his great love for us, that we should do that for our friends, for those who are around us as well. I'm not going to spend the next five minutes rolling through scriptures. What I am going to do is to point you back to that room that I took you to before. What, how had Jesus shown his love for you just in that room before? Because at that point you hadn't seen him give his life for you, the greatest act of love that Jesus showed to the whole world. At that point, you just had the saviour of the world take off an outer robe, wrap it around himself, get a bowl of water and wash your feet. As I have loved you guys sat in this room, so you should love one another. You should wash each other's feet. There are plenty of Christian churches, denominations, that foot washing is still a part of their normal patterns. And that's the reference for it. And so, (laughs) you should see the terror in some of your eyes because you think I'm about to go and find some water and some towels. (laughs) We're not going to do foot washing, all right? I mean, knock yourself out if you want to. But I'm not entirely sure, don't do it here, by the way. Um, I'm I'm not entirely sure that that is necessary. The point that Jesus was making is, the love I've shown you in that act is one of selflessness. It's one of humility. It's one of me putting aside my rights and my privilege in order to serve you. Some of us struggle to put aside our right to have the right opinion on any given subject in order to be part of a community of people, let alone take off an outer robe, wrap it around ourselves and humbly wash someone else's feet. But what if, what if, you say to me, the person that I'm supposed to be showing love to has clearly fallen into sin? What if they've made decisions that are contrary to the way God would have us live? What if very evil has entered into them? I can't surely be called to sacrificially and humbly show them love, ought I? And then you see Jesus looking up at you as he kneels before the feet of Judas, washing the feet of the one who had fallen so deeply, who had betrayed him, who very evil had entered, so we're told in Luke 13. Yes, yes, abundantly yes, says Jesus, those people you need to love. 
Those people you need to humble yourselves and to serve as if you are washing their feet. Yes, those people, not just those that feel the same about you, not just those with nice, tidy, pre-washed feet, but those with the dirty, smelly feet. Yes, abundantly, those are the people whose feet you need to wash. And then Jesus ups the ante. We're coming into land quite soon. He ups the ante because he says, by this will everyone know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. My particular role working across family of church, Baptist churches in the southwest is to do with mission. And people will often ask me, what, what does that mean? Well, it can mean all kinds of different things. But here, Jesus, effectively in a sentence, says to his followers, to you guys, to us as his church, this is how people will know. You want an evangelism course? I mean, I can suggest a thousand of them. Most of you have done a thousand of them already. Putting them into practice is the thing we struggle with, isn't it? But this is the one sentence evangelism course. By this will all people know that you're my disciples they will know what the kingdom of heaven looks like. They'll be attracted to me through the church if you love one another. That is where the challenge lies for us. In a second, we're going to watch a very short video, which is one of those Bell of Reality videos. And then I just want to spend a couple of minutes thinking about how we can love one another as we come to communion. Can we watch that video now, guys? Thanks very much. If even a little bit of that is true, then we've got a challenge, have we not? So what are we going to do about it? Well, here are some ways that I see love for each other demonstrated in our family. I see those who have fallen sick, walking that journey through the toughest time in their lives, hand in hand with sisters and brothers, who literally will be up through the night praying with them and walking alongside of them. I see those who are struggling with things like finance, finding that they're in a community of people, not because they want their help, but who just want to demonstrate their love by helping out. That might look like getting out of a bad situation financially, as much as it looks like just giving people money or food or what have you. I see people who care desperately when things happen with things like housing, when people find themselves without somewhere to live, come and stay here for a little bit. I, I see evidence of people who are the be very best of friends, despite the fact that they don't agree on some pretty big stuff very often. 
I see those called to serve in ministry, serving alongside each other, even though, even though, naturally, in the world at large, probably they'd never spend any time with each other, yet they do so and love each other because of the mission that they're called to together. I see evidence of this. What I don't want to leave us with today is just that uh, sense of we're doing a bad job, because I don't think we are. There is evidence of the love of God that we see in this family, but the challenge is that there could be more, that it could be more obvious, that that love could be deeper still, that the witness to the ways of God's kingdom could be stronger still to the very many people who we're in contact with because we learn to love each other in that humble, servant-hearted, sacrificial, foot-washing, life-giving way that Jesus loves us. To respond to this today, and I am aware of the fact that for some of us, there is pain that we've known from being hurt by others in churches, possibly this one. For, for some, there might be a sense of challenge that we need to do this better. We need to respond if God has spoken to us by his spirit and through his word. And we're going to do that through sharing communion together. Because in this, in communion, what we see is the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate act of love. Jesus giving himself for all creation so that we could be restored to right relationship with our creator. This is the most profound, fundamental act of love. As we remember Jesus' sacrifice for us, so we confess before Jesus the times that we have been less than loving to each other. And if necessary, we ask one another for forgiveness. But we determine to live better lives, supported, inspired and strengthened by the Spirit of God. And we do that in a very tangible way, with bread and wine at the communion table. So I'm going to pray, we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to come to communion. Father God, I pray that we learn instead of disagreeing with one another, Lord, to speak out the things that we can agree on. Help us, God, to be people, Lord, that aren't constantly held in negative and in angst, but instead are recognising the ways that you call us to be together as your children. Lord, thank you for those that have gone before us who've written words that together we can declare. Lord, with a real sense of yes and amen, these are the things that together we believe in. God, may we learn to love you and through that love each other more. And Lord, I pray that we as your people become a stronger witness for you and your kingdom in the world around us because of the love that we have for each other. As we come to your table, we do so humbly now. And Lord, as we sing and we declare who you are, Lord, help us, God, to come humbly before you. Amen.